on this episode of Skeptico, a show about freedom and self-evident truths. I have an interview coming up in a minute with Matt Lambeau, a first-time author who's written a book that matter-of-factly lays out what he believes are some self-evident truths. But before we get there, let me play a little clip from an old movie, Amistad, where I think they're talking about self-evident truth. I do see that the cargo weight changed. They reduced the poundage, I'd see. That is all. So if you remember the story, well, I can't really call it a story, the history. There's these Spanish guys that go over to Africa. They grab these people by gunpoint, chain them up, load them on a boat, and head off on their little slaving business venture. But along the way, the Africans rise up, have a little mutiny, and decide that maybe those Spaniards should sail them back to Africa. Now, it doesn't turn out that way, and they get captured by an American ship, and that leads to this court battle. And the scene that you saw there is where they were wrestling with the legality of whether that cargo, human lives, could be thrown overboard to reduce the weight of the ship. Now, I think for a lot of us, that falls into the category of a self-evident truth. That is that you can't enslave people and force them to do what you want by threat of death. Here's the way today's guest, Matt Lambeau, puts it. All conscious souls long to be free. We want to make our own decisions using our own volition so we can decide for ourselves what's right and wrong. So anybody who doesn't agree with the first fact is going to fall into three categories. They're either ignorant, of which I'm making of calculus. I get it. We're all ignorant. They're captive. They no longer have freedom of thought. Or they're either complicit or corrupt. Your conscious soul was alive before you were born. It will be alive after you die. This exercise on life is a lucid dream where your conscious soul is navigating the physical energy of our universe. With that said, selfishness in its simplest sense is demanding that others conform to your perception of reality. Selfishness on a larger scale is you taking the life, liberty, or pursuit of happiness from another individual. So this is an interesting interview. You might like it. You might hate it. But one thing I wanted to point out is that, you know, even though Matt doesn't have a PhD, he sure nailed the moral imperative question a lot better than last week's guest, Dr. Dean Radin. If you remember, Radin kind of stumbled over the idea of whether morality could ever come into the equation. Yeah, you're talking about issues of morality and ethics, and uh, it's it might be related to all this, but I'm I'm not sure I would go there. And it's extra funny because he kind of does the heavy lifting. I mean, the only way you can maintain the idea that morality is always, under every circumstance, a social construct, is to believe that we're biological robots in a meaningless universe. So it's amazing to me that the scientist who's probably done more than anyone else to scientifically dispel that idea can't make the step, can't see the obvious implications for the moral imperative, for self-evident truths like freedom. Hope you like this one. Stick around for my interview with Matt Lambeau. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and today we welcome Matt Lambeau to Skeptico. Matt is the author of The Facts. I pulled up his author page on Amazon here. And this book, and we've been chatting about it a little bit in the forum, is a wild ride. And I've kind of encouraged Matt to come out from his bombastic kind of pseudonym personality that he is in writing this book and tell us what it's really about. The, the book does claim to be the ultimate source of truth and wisdom about, well, almost everything. But, but what I want to bring forth in this interview, and I was just telling Matt this, 
is I want you to reserve your temptation to dismiss Matt and to dismiss that the claims that might kind of hit you over the head and really think about what he's saying and the necessity he feels about putting it forth in this way. If you do, I think you'll find what I have found, and that's that this guy has some super interesting things to say and to talk about and some very, very skeptical-ish kind of ideas. So, Matt, it's uh, terrific having you on. Welcome to Skeptico. Amigo, truly a pleasure. Truly a pleasure. So let's start with the obvious. Tell, tell us about the book, The Facts. Okay. Uh, yep, The Facts is the first book in three of them. It's called Humanity's Last Hope. The subsequent books are The War Against Evil and The Battle for the Benjamins. And uh, uh, The Facts is basically my attempt. I'm a researcher. Okay, and over the last decade, I've grown frustrated as as everybody in terms of our uh, just what's happening in the world and the division between us, the inability, the fact that we can be family members or best friends and we see the world from completely different paradigms. The exact world we're sharing, we see completely differently. And that intrigued me in terms of why the hell this is happening. And truth be told, one of the first epiphanies in my life was when I was finally introduced to George Orwell. And for those that haven't read George Orwell, Animal Farm is pretty straightforward. It's saying, hey, here's how a narrative can be manipulated by those that might have a sinister agenda. And then 1984 was simply saying, this is what happens when you do it on a global scale. It all becomes one big lie. You're either part of the lie or you're views or perception of the world is a product of that deceit. So that was an epiphany in my life that said, oh, okay, now I get why we see the world differently. George Orwell just showed us what's happening. And that is we're being fed through our media, a paradigm of reality that on one, in my humble opinion, on one side is completely inaccurate and nothing but lies. And the other side is true. 100% true. So the facts is basically my pursuit to see if I can't go find these truths that I call self-evident truths and line them up simply, simply so a moron like me can follow the steps. And in doing that, I believe the facts takes your mind, not your physical body, but your mind above the fray on earth. You might have mentioned it starts off with, to be a spoiler, we're, we're killed. The reader and the author are killed together. We're now floating like an, an NDE, first above the accident scene, now above the planet Earth. And because we're in the next destination, information flows into us like a thing. And so basically the reader and me are researching the facts. And what that means is we're following somebody like you that went out and discovered the science and the spirituality of these things. And so my role is simply to simplify this stuff so the rest of us can follow your lead. And Matt, when you say facts, it's capitalized because it's an acronym. What does it stand for? Correct. And that's a crucial distinction. Okay. Because the facts is an acronym for finding answers that confirm truth about self Okay, so selfishness. Obviously, we're all selfish. But truth be told, in the spiritual world, it's all that matters. In the spiritual world, you're either selfish or you're humble. It's yin, it's yang. It's right, it's wrong. It's dark, it's light. And to take it a step further, let me form a little context, okay? Because again, to use the term like the facts is audacious. Who's this guy that says he knows the facts? But when you qualify it to say the facts only apply to that which is most important in life, okay? Not, so they're not the facts to everything. They're only the facts to what's most important in life. And that can be established by chasing down this little culprit called selfishness. Now, to put it into context real quickly, again, we die in the book. And so truth be told, I believe it's fact one, two, or three, your conscious soul was alive before you were a human being on planet Earth. 
surprise. Your conscious soul will be alive once you die and are reborn. This is no longer a topic of discussion. This is something that science and spirituality has proven. Let me Go stop you it. right there, because Perfect. this is where I think it starts getting interesting, because what you just said is true. Science has, beyond a reasonable doubt, if you want to put a legal standard on it, established exactly that. Consciousness yes. survives bodily death in a way that we don't understand. And I think what you're well, really, we... what you're highlighting here is super important, and it's the reason that I wanted to have you on, Matt, because even if we sort through a lot of the stuff you're saying, and if someone doesn't necessarily agree with it, you've just put your finger on like, a really important thing, which is that okay. this is self evident. It's not only true, but it's self evident. And it's self evident for anyone who seeks it out. Because it's not self evident in the way that you could have some kind of uh, divine revelation that it's true. It's self evident that if you go out and seek for this truth, by the means that we normally associate with doing that science, logic, reason, you come to that conclusion. So why have so many people not come to that conclusion? That's what I think you're really bringing forth here that I think you do in quite a beautiful way. Astute observation there, young Jedi. I don't want to jump around yeah, no, too much, no, I, but I think your metaphor of the tree is just, is just wonderful. It's wonderful. Tell us about the tree. Okay the tree of life all right good i'll do as best i can to explain it now let me finish on that first thought the fact that my conscious soul was alive before i was born and that it'll be alive after i die is irrefutably proven and again not only science but billions if not trillions of testimonies from caretakers or what be it i mean the fact that we still have a discussion about what happens when we die is ludicrous we need to move above it. We need to move above that frequency and start figuring out just what happens. So if your spirit was alive before you were born and it will be alive after, that begs the question, why are we a human being? Okay, why are we here? And truth be told, it's to navigate the energy that is Earth. And when you look at selfishness or humility, First of all, you know this, and it's early on in the book. It's just a little physics understanding that's saying, dude, there is no solid. If you're the size of an electron, even the inside of a diamond looks like the universe. It's nothing but space and little dots. So what we perceive as real is not. It's an illusion, and it's unique to us alone. We all have our own independent, unique perceptions of the world. So selfishness in its simple sense is you being a human being and demanding that others conform to your paradigm of reality. That's it. Humility is the opposite. It's saying, I'm going to live my life with recognition of somebody else's paradigm. You got Hitler on one extreme, our boy JC on the other. We're somewhere in between. But the fact of the matter is, in the spiritual world, all that matters is selfishness and humility. It is by where we judge. Now, to take it a step further in terms of saving humanity, you say, listen, you, you, um, humility comes through giving true joy. So if you're in a complete state of despair, the truth of the facts is that you can eliminate that despair by simply giving to others. Positive energy will flow into your life. So you can see it goes a bit deeper, and, and but you're with me. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm with you. You know, the way that... Uh... You know, the way that one of my favorite guys says it is is twofold. He says, the first part of what you're saying is don't complain about the weather. Yeah. So that's easier for me to do. I live in Southern California on the beach. Harder for yeah. you to do if you live in Minnesota. But it's the Thanks. same. Why do you think you're at the center of this universe, the center of this infinite time stream that you should be complaining about the weather. That's point one. And that's to your point about selfishness. To me, that's what selfishness about is about. And the second thing that he says is don't pass that car. 
yeah, I know she's driving 30 and the speed limit's 35. And if it's 35, you really can go 40 and all. Don't pass the car. Because again, it's selfishness. It's thinking that you have to get ahead. You have to do something that there's some God has some plan for you, some mission for you that only you can do. No, God just wants you to be with that woman right now and consider whatever the hell is going in her head that makes her want to wear a mask when there's no one in the car and drive 30 when the speed limit's 35. Yeah. God wants you to not hate that person. And oh, God wants you to yeah. not pass that car. And that is my interpretation of what you're saying that resonates with me on such a beautiful level. And so, so few people get that, Matt. And you are my spiritual brother because you get that stuff just like a duck swimming in water. I mean, it's just all a part of what you're about. Yeah. Well, and again, I've, I've got this. Uh, everything in my world just seems like common sense. And I don't know why that is. And I mean, the, like what we just talked about, that saying this is common sense. I don't get why this is, of course, that, um, you know, our spirits are alive and we're navigating this energy and we've got our own volition. And yes, we answer to right and wrong decisions because our selfish decisions always take us into frequencies of darkness, regardless, every time. It's no longer something that needs to be studied our selfless decisions that accommodate our brethren take us into the light true joy you can get happiness in the form of ferrari true, true joy only comes through giving that's it and to give just a tiny little amount means positive energy of light pours into your conscious soul and so uh to, again, the problem and why I come across so condescending is for some reason for me it's all common sense it's crazy. I look around the world. And so then uh, with that said, is you, we can't blame somebody for their ignorance. There's no obligation or mandate to understand this crap. Okay. But with that said, ignorance can be a big time danger to my freedom, especially if they've got power or they can vote or they're a patriarch or family or something, if these people are completely selfish because they don't understand what we just talked about, they can be making lives around them miserable. So the ticket out of that is to get them to the Holy Grail and say, dude, this is the way the world works. You're, you're, you're punishing your kids because you don't understand. Matt, tell us about the tree metaphor. Okay. So it's called the tree of life. And just by happenstance, I didn't discover this till late, but it's like one of the first few sentences right in Genesis. I mean, whether you're a Bible reader or not, I, I thought it was kind of coincidental. And it's basically saying that the tree of life is truth. It's simply this tree of life that's saying there are self-evident truths, okay? And those truths need to be protected because there are forces out there that do not want conscious souls to understand this truth. So if you look at the tree of life, it's basically saying that all of humanity agrees with the roots. The roots of the tree are yin and yang, darkness and light, fear and love, selfishness and humility. Every single conscious decision a human being makes is one or the other. You're either going down to the frequencies of dark. Every single decision can be registered in terms of what it was to, for the benefit of my own paradigm or somebody else's. So those self-evident truths are the roots of the tree. Okay, now, since all of humanity agrees with the roots, and two, this yin or yang of uh, fear or love supersedes even that of an ineffable creator. It's the way all universes work. It's just the way. So... The tree of life then is going to the, the trunk starts with the first fact, the first self-evident truth, which is the most obvious. And we would agree on that. That says, this is the most important. Now I have that one written. We can discuss it. But we talk, instead of humanity spending their whole life to understand what you and I understand, we're going to give it to them at the outset. That says your conscious soul is alive and there's intelligence within our atmosphere that we don't understand. You're getting that one first. Play it back. What's the trunk of the tree? I love this metaphor, by the way. I think it's quite brilliant. Play that back. The first fundamental truth. 
Again, I love it. It's self-evident, yeah. but not everybody gets it. So go I ahead. I get it. Okay. And so again, you use the term metaphor. Okay. I think that falls short. I think we are indeed, it, as bombastic as it might sound, talking about the actual tree of life, the Genesis tree of life, because it's simply a protected portal. It's truth. When it, when humanity went into the darkness and the light, we have to find the light, and that's nothing but truth. Spiritual energy is synonymous with intelligence. It's the same thing. Your thought process is alive because you think that's intelligence. And again, you were alive before you were a conscious soul. Okay, okay. Truth thing. Uh, the tree. Again, the trunk. Trunk, okay? Trunk is saying... You start with the first fact. You learn that. Now your conscious soul has gone one frequency above the fray on earth. The next fact takes you closer. The next one closer. And I gave you the top 10 facts. Recap, because you did such a good job. I'm, tr I'm trying to pull that back out of you. Fact number one is beautiful. Tell us it again, just succinctly. What's fact number okay. one? Okay. Fact number one is this. And when you hear this, your conscious soul, not your body, your mind moves up into a frequency that's smarter than the rest of humanity. And that fact is this. All conscious souls long to be free. We want to make our own decisions using our own volition, and we want to experience this planet so we can decide for ourselves what's right and wrong. We want to be free. Okay. okay. And the other thing, the other thing I heard you say before, so maybe I, 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 you, this is part of that, but I heard you say that right above the root is just this understanding that we are conscious beings mm -hmm. in this spiritual world, because, you know, people who followed this show, I mean, I don't know why, but I'm with you, bro. I had to pound on this for years. If we come to understand and study, really, that science is telling you you're a biologic robot in a meaningless universe. Science, where your kids went to school there, mm -hmm. my kids went to school, they were, this was drilled into them over and over and over again. There is no meaning. There is no consciousness. Consciousness is an illusion. Consciousness is an epiphenomena of the brain. Shut up. There's nothing to it. So right off the bat, you're hitting us with two things. You're saying at the root is, hell yes, there's a moral imperative. There's a right, there's a wrong. You knew that when you were five years old. Why are right. you letting somebody tell you different? You know that's true. And then the next thing you're hitting us with is saying, and come on, you know that you're conscious. You know that that voice inside your head is real. You know that if you be completely silent and say hello, something inside you hears that hello and answers back and you are conscious. Why did you ever let someone convince you to even entertain the idea that that isn't real? Why did you fall for that? That's what I hear you saying. That's where I hear you being agitated in the same way that I'm agitated because that leads to the question is, why would someone try and deceive us that way? Why would someone try and kind of slip one past us at, at, at such a degree? And why the heck are they so effective at it? Okay, answer your own question. I know why, what do you think? I don't think we're quite there yet. Okay, because what I want people to hear is that, again, I'm, I'm using the term metaphor. I think yeah, it's a beautiful yeah. metaphor. I think these roots get to this trunk, and then I want you to move into the metaphor. What are the okay. branches? What are the twigs? What are the leaves? Got it. got it, got it. All right, good. Yep. So the first fact, all right, is saying, again, you've been indoctrinated with untruths. But with the first fact, we can lift whoever reads it fact above the fray. They're now in a frequency where they get it. Okay. So the fact, the first fact too is, again, let me, let me just explain the metaphor a little further. Imagine the world is, is covered with an ocean of deception. 
okay? And the tree of life is a portal out of that oil spill up through the, the muck into the light. And that's what we have to protect is this path to go up in frequencies and in intelligence outside of the, the, the cesspool of deception. So fact one lifts us above it. Hey, we're, we're all want to be free. We're conscious souls. We're alive. Okay. Now, anybody that disagrees or doesn't understand that becomes a danger to your freedom. Okay. Not because they're a human being, Donald Trump or Barack Obama or my wife. None of that matters. What matters is the ideology, the thoughts in their head are a danger. So anybody who doesn't agree with the first fact is going to fall into three categories. They're either ignorant, of which I'm making of calculus. I get it. We're all ignorant. They're either ignorant, they're captive, they no longer have freedom of thought, or they're either complicit or corrupt, which means they understand what you and I are saying and they don't give a rat's ass. Okay. So now the next step two. All right. So we educated them on the first step. Here's step two. Your conscious soul was alive before you were born. It will be alive after you die. This exercise on life is called a lucid dream where your conscious soul is navigating the physical energy of our universe. With that said, selfishness in its simplest sense is demanding that others conform to your perception of reality. Okay. Selfishness on a larger scale is you taking the faith, freedom, or finance, or the life, liberty, or pursuit of happiness from another individual, okay? Selfishness on a simple sense of making my family demand conform to my reality. On a larger scope, I want the world, and I need for me to get my agenda. I need your, your life, your liberty, or your pursuit of happiness. So right there, you can see the dichotomy between good and evil. Every single decision, whether it's Putin's, whether it's Trump's, it can all be measured on whether or not they're fighting for freedom or control. And that's only step two of the trunk. Imagine if we take them all 10 where they'll be. I think that's super powerful stuff. And I think it would take us a long time to kind of fully deconstruct that, but we have to try because I don't think we can kind of jump to all the other stuff without just kind of breaking that down. And as I said, his book is, if you're going to buy this book or you're going to pick it up at his website for free, if he still has it for free, don't yeah, tell him because we want him to buy it. But when you get to the book, when you get to the actual book, you're going to be surprised and you're going to be impressed because as you can tell, this guy has a command of these issues. So I want to pick up on some of the things that you just said there. And I want to draw out one of them because you've mentioned the evil thing. But the part that I really wanted to highlight is that you're being deceived. We all know that there are people who have motives that aren't in line with the light and with the good. And yet we constantly want to pretend that that's not the case. I interviewed this FBI agent a while back and he was an undercover guy and not a lot of the FBI agents go undercover. Mm -hmm. And he had gone undercover with the NAMBLA group, North NAMBLA. American man, man, boy, uh, love social made funny by the South park thing, but not so funny when you mm -hmm. really listen to his story and how he went to New York city and I was in times square and the kid, all the guys wanted to go in to toys R us cause they had a giant Ferris wheel and they could watch the little kids. And he said, what really got me is it's not just that they were watching the little kids. They were talking about how they wanted to hurt them, what they wanted to do. And it wasn't just about sex. It was about inflicting pain mm -hmm. and suffering. And he said, Alex, if I wasn't undercover, I would have picked them up and thrown them over that freaking 20 foot railing and enjoyed watching their heads splat on the, on the floor below. And the reason I bring that up to people sometimes is like, you said you don't think there's evil. Mm -hmm. Well, what about that? And people quickly crumble and go, okay, no, I get it. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's evil. But I think the deeper question, and again, if you take it from the tree standpoint that you're talking mm -hmm. about, we can start to unravel this question, which is, I think what you do in the book, which is, if we're all about light and dark, if we're all about good and evil, selfishness and 
the freedom from selfishness, which comes from humility, comes from giving, then maybe we can understand people who can't get that energy to flow, can't get that life force to flow through the tree. And what they wind up doing is the only way they can get it to flow is to put it out in a really, really harmful, negative way that we can only speculate what that's going to do to their soul. But the point being, this is a fundamental, I don't want to say shift, because it shouldn't be a shift. Because as Matt's pointing out, this is fundamentally self-evident as soon as someone explains it to you. Of course, that's what evil is about. We all know that we have evil within us because we have that energy that comes up and we don't know what to do with it. And we make bad choices about what to do with it. And that leads to further bad choices. And that leads to more bad choices. And before you know it, the only thing we can do is to continue to make those bad choices. At least that's what we perceive. Because the other thing that Matt and I agree about is you can always choose the light. The light is always shining. And the light is a thousand times, a million times, an infinite number of times greater than the darkness. So it isn't that hard, really. And that's what I think your book is about. It's just you just need someone to reassure you. So Agreed. continue to tell us about the tree. All right, perfect. Um, and yes, that frequency, the top frequency of love is not only accessible, it's a frequency just beyond your nose. You're enveloped in it. You just need to figure out how to get to it. And truth is, you get to it through giving, through humility. The moment, simple signs of humility, instantly the frequency you are, you're catapulted to the frequency of love. So anybody can do it. It's just an understanding thing. And when you think in terms of who would have indoctrinated our children to not understand this simple, most self-evident truth, it's somebody with an ulterior motive. They've got a sinister agenda. It's just who they are. So when you talk in terms of, of pedophilia, again, selfishness in its simplest sense is me demanding that others conform to my perception of reality. Could there be anything more egregious? than for me to violate somebody of uh, under age, that's the ultimate form of selfishness. I'm, want, I'm going to manipulate you because you're naive and you're young into my paradigm. I think the button that it pushes related back to, I think what you said really, really quite profoundly, if we go back to it, is control. And I oh, think yeah. if, we're, if we're honest, we all have control issues. Like you said, hey man, I got control issues all over the place. Like you said, I, I got control issues in my family, right? I want my mm -hmm. wife to do a certain thing and why didn't you do, I want my kids to be a certain way. Hey, you gotta do, you know, I, I got control issues. I understand that. Well, like you said, imagine if those control issues start going really, really bad. Do you think that kind of might start to explain why you would want to abuse a helpless child that you can totally control or take it to where you did, which I think is again, self-evident once someone points it out to you, let's say you were a Gatesy kind of person and let's say you had this enormous wealth, this enormous power and influence, and it didn't quite work for you. It still wasn't quite lifting your soul up. Might you want to exercise that control in a way to see, well, maybe, maybe if I control the, maybe if I can control more, is that, I'm just throwing that out there. Is that possibly an explanation for what we see? Is it maybe part of the explanation for what we see? Cause here's a guy with Gatesy who had more money than he could ever spend. Well, one, he was kind of born into it, but he legitimately made more money than anyone could spend by the time he was 25 years old. So. What, what do we do? We need another self-evident. Do we need another explanation for why he would seek to do to exercise his control in such a negative way? No, I don't know this. I'm, I'm building off of what you said. So I want to yeah, pull no, you back. I to, think yeah, it strikes me as it's explained. It's explained when you go down the, the path that says, listen, again, it's freedom or control, right or wrong, black or white, that type of thing. 
When you go down that path and it becomes about you, it means you fall so far into the abyss, you become what I call a demon. And a demon is simply a human being that's 100% selfish, zero humility. Okay, and they're everywhere. Trust me, the leader of North Korea does not have an ounce of humility. He's a walking demon. Okay, we have to, again, some, I, I'm not looking for trouble here. I'll just use him as an example because he came to mind first. But think about it. There are people that have lived their entire lives and nothing has ever mattered other than their own paradigm of reality. On the flip side of that, through spiritual growth, some people have lived their entire lives for others. I, I, I get you. The only point I can't resist throwing out is, hey, man, he was born into it, that guy in North Korea. It's like when you talk to somebody who's who's in a cult, you know, and I yep. talked to a guy recently, wonderful, wonderful person, spiritual being, and I love him, and he just passed, and he was a Mooney. Remember the Moonies, you know, Sun, Young, yeah, Moon, yeah. God, yeah. God, I'm, I'm Jesus, all that. And yeah. uh, so after being in it for 30 years, 30 years, Matt, he mm -hmm. found a way out, and now he works with and has worked with some people who are second generation Moonies. Mm -hmm. Wrap your head around that. Because we can all say, oh, you freaking Moonies, how could you be so stupid? How could you fall for that? But no, now take this next generation. Your mom and your dad are Moonies. Oh. They Dude, raise I you as Moonies. Every event you've ever been to in your life is all Moonies, is all Mormon, is all Jehovah Witness, is all First Presbyterian Church. Now, do we have to look at that person with a different sense of compassion, a different sense of understanding of how that worldview is, is, is formed? I think we do. And I want well, to give a chance to respond, and then I want to come back to the tree. Right. So I, uh, uh, I, th there's only one way out, and it's truth. So uh, to be a Mooney, that indoctrination process is no different than probably what I went through as a Catholic. I mean, we're being told certain things, whether they're, you know, there might be some semblance of truth wrapped in the deception. But bottom line is, whatever energy we were privy to, and if that's caved in as a Mooney, or if it's in North Korea, or what be it, but either way, that's our paradigm of the world. That is our subjective truth. And to try to penetrate inside of that, you're dealing with something called an inexorable belief. It's like, you know, again, you can't, you, you think you could ever make a Christian become Islam or vice versa? No, they're inexorable beliefs that will not be changed, right? And so if you were an indoctrinated with the Moody as a Moody, or whatever it might be, whatever caused you to go off course from truth, your only salvation is truth. The only way, Mr. Leader in North Korea that's been indoctrinated for 30 years, it's all he knows, is to find the Holy Grail and to read that first fact. And that might open up his mind that's saying, I don't have to be this monster. I could free my people and save my soul. Truth is the only way out of the cesspool of deception. Right on. Back to the tree. Okay. okay, an important distinction is that all of humanity agrees on 99.9% .9 of what's most important in life. Where we disagree are the leaves of discovery. So we can follow the trunk of the facts up through the branches that says this big branch here is somebody uh, Einstein's ultimatum that says you can live your one of two ways. You can live your life as though it's a miracle or as though it's not. Okay, this big fat branch is humanity that believes life is a miracle. This little branch that went to the side are the atheists. And if you believe in the atheists, hop on that branch because through those leaves of nourishment, that might become the trunk. It might be what's right. But right now, the big part of the trunk is, listen, there's an ineffable creator and he's benevolent and he loves us. And that now we no longer talk about other things because this is a self-evident truth until proven wrong. So the we all of humanity agrees on the trunk. All of 99% of humanity agrees on the largest branches. The other ones are going out up through the twigs is where the intellectual conversation you and I are having. Those are the twigs of discovery and the leaves of nourishment. But you and I and everybody in North Korea, and we all agree on what's important. 
humanity. We need to change things. We don't want it to be a shit show. We want what's best for each other. We all agree on that stuff. Now, someone who might not has been indoctrinated, okay, and they see the world upside down, but the only way to reach them is a simple concept that says, have you joined the free world? No, what is it? Go here. Boom. All of a sudden now we... And, I, I consider the facts the only indoctrination that's necessary in this world is to get off on the right path with what's real. And once you do that, now you're in an intellectual discovery up in the, and does that, did I explain it fine? I mean, are you, you gathering it? Yeah. So what I thought we'd do, okay. so that's, that's awesome. And I love that metaphor. And I think people will, will see that as quite. You buy quite, into it though? You buy into oh, it? I, bro. I think it's brilliant. I think it's absolutely <laughs> as a Bro. metaphor, though. No, I, I, I mean that, Matt. I mean that as a metaphor. It's absolutely brilliant. I, I, I think it's so worthwhile. But that's why they wrote it in Genesis. Do you want to pull this thing just right into the know, right I'm, into the, the right into the ditch? Here's the thing: is that the Bible is an incredibly spiritually enriching document for a lot of people it becomes a source of finding the truth for millions and millions of people but that don't mean it's real mm -hmm. that don't mean it's really inspired or anything like that so when people start talking about the bible as if it's true as if something really happened 2000 years ago and history was changed no bro it, it's no dear it's always and forever it's now. The light is shining now. The light shined 2,000 years ago, yes, but it's shined 2,001 years ago. So I think that mm -hmm. the potential for Christianity to be just another version of Mooney's, you know, 10.0, where it's, you know, 40 generations, I'm not saying that's the way it is. I think that's the way it is. I'm just saying we would have to fully consider that from a historical, archaeological perspective in terms of whether or not that really holds up. I would add this so that people hearing this can understand my process, is I pushed you on that. I checked you as hard as I could on that. And I loved the way you came back. Because the way you came back is, hey, that's a small branch for me, Alex. I'm at the mm -hmm. roots. I'm at the trunk, Alex, which is spiritual truths. So I, I, if I'm on the wrong branch over here, no problem, bro. I just hop over to the other branch. But Absolutely. my roots, That's my exactly roots are it. still my roots. My big, strong trunk that lifts me up out of the ignorance is still my trunk. And that can't be shaken. I so mm -hmm. respect that. So love that about you and what you do. Well, in that, uh, um, again, when I threw out the Genesis thing, that was to kind of tweak you a little bit. Um, but again, the reason it's resonating with you has nothing to do with the fact that I might have been the one who discovered the concept. It's resonating because it's true. It's obvious. It's common sense now that saying as we move up and we discover we're hopping branches. Yeah. And the one that happens to be the absolute truth will become the trunk, you know, Um now, one quick thing on the Bible, because you and I are on the exact same page, okay? Christian indoctrination in my world is no different than any other type of indoctrination, okay? And when it comes to the Bible, in my subjective opinion, hey, I see it as a, a, a mystical book written by man, possibly divinely inspired, but without question, subject to interpretation, Everything no, is divinely inspired. Would you agree? Every book, every important book that's ever been written is divinely inspired. 100% agree. And so the books in the Bible are no different. There's a case to be made that that the books of John and the Apostle Paul were nothing but near death, next destination experiences. And they're writing them down. I mean, on the road to Damascus, he saw Jesus. That doesn't surprise me. Over the last 2,000 years, this happened to millions of people whether it's Jesus or not. But bottom line is he went to the other destination, learned a little bit, came back, started talking about it. I see it no greater than that. And again, the book, the reason I hold the Bible with reverence, again, I've never read the whole thing. And I, again, it's subject to interpretation, but I see it as a mystical document that says the moment you open it, your mind 
transcends from your human cesspool to that of your spiritual realities. And hopefully that takes you into the light. And if that's what that book does for some people, my guess is that's why it's here. Anything else, it doesn't matter. It's no different than probably the most influential book I ever read was Embraced by the Light, which was my introduction to near-death experiences. Way more significant in my life than the Bible. Let's talk about near-death experiences, how you're processing it through your lens. What does NDE stand for, Matt? Well, again, when you say you use it as near-death experience, that that's counterintuitive because you don't have to be near death. You can have these. My wife had one when I was traumatically hurt. Basically, what has to happen is something traumatic happens in your life where the future and the past no longer matter. All that's important is the now. In this case, I had gotten hit by a car, so my wife-to-be was concerned. I might be over, but she slipped into it. Absolutely. She's now in the now, and that allows your spirit to go places it normally wouldn't have. So it doesn't have to be near death. And those trying to debunk it are saying, well, was the brain really cl clinically? None of that stuff matters. You know, it was Dr. Even Alexander. You had him on your show. He proved that guy's a freaking neurosurgeon. I mean, really, we're going to argue with this guy? But the point is, is it doesn't need to be a dead brain. That just proves it, that there are people that are comatose. And absolutely, they're watching the scene, talking about what the EMTs were wearing. Okay. And that is in irrefutable proof. So end of discussion. It's real. Let's move forward. Let's move above it. And so, yeah, when I was introduced to those, it changed my life. I'm going, fuck, there's proof about this stuff. Why is nobody listening? And so you coined this term, I love it, next destination okay, experience yes. and i think i think again what that brings what that brings forward and this is what you do is you say look if that is self-evident based on the science logic reason which it is and uh -huh. you're also hanging it out there if it isn't prove it to yeah. me but otherwise i provided enough evidence that the burden of truth is on someone outside of the facts to prove it otherwise and since no one's going forward, then you got to go with Matt's truth. So then you said, you know what, guys, I appreciate that you've done all this work. And for the last 20 years, you've published over 200 peer reviewed articles on it. And you have all this good stuff. But you know what, you really mislabeled it. Why did they mislabel it? And what should it be labeled? Next destination experience. That's all it is, is the peak on the other side it has nothing to do with death. Yes, when we die, Obviously, we go to the next destination, but it defeats it, it because by saying near death, you're ruling out the contributions of mediums or, or meditation or whatever else. I mean, yeah. Anyway, so it's just one no, of those little no, pieces. No, anyways, of the I know it's it's the little pieces of the puzzle are all we can ever hope for in the best day, you know. But I'll, right. I'll tell you this: I'm just about to publish an interview with a guy fantastic guy. His name is William Peters. And he's one of the world's leading authorities, shared death experience. Okay, so William mm -hmm. has this institute, multiple PhDs, medical doctors has done real research, shared death experiences, right? So this is where you're going with this. This is yeah. you are already anticipating this science, this very important science, because I don't know if this matches your wife's experience. But what's happening is people are with someone who are who are crossing over or experiencing this glimpse or, or who are actually journeying to the other side and they are journeying with them. They are going part of that way. They are seeing deceased relatives. They are seeing the light. Yeah. They're seeing the so this is science again confirming what you figured out there in minnesota yeah. just after a couple of couple well, of rounds it's, millions, it's it's like a million people walking into the courtroom and saying i saw oj do it and then there's still people that won't believe that evidence that's not enough that doesn't suffice for me you know, so it's ridiculous. And now when you incorporate the wisdom we've learned, yeah, you when you pass to the other side, you uh, could go into darkness, you can go into light. The uh, There's a lot of options over there. But uh, bottom line is it's it's bullshit to see, keep talking like the stuff isn't real. I mean, that's called intellectual pollution. If we don't move above that conversation, say, hey, you guys are entitled to your old, your old branch. 
feel free and feel free to populate it. Come back to us with whatever you got. But the rest of the trunk, we're moving forward. Right on. So a uh, couple other points and then we'll we'll wrap this up and people okay. can join this conversation by checking out Matt's book, The Facts. Talk about ET. This is another topic that for a lot of people, when I bring it up, people are like, Oh, my God, why are you mixing that in and just talk about parapsychology or just talk about psi or just talk about because you know, and I'm like, No, I'm with Matt here. It's just about whatever truth comes along. I'm like, Oh, okay, I didn't know that truth. Oh, school me educate me. Oh, that's true. Okay, well, I guess I'll have to fit that into my tree. So what do we know about UFOs? What do we know about ET, Matt? Well, what I've learned through you and years and years of research and, and delving into the truth is that it's as real as the nose on our face. Okay, again, I'm going to go back to Nikki Six's analogy. and she's, It's like an onion. Okay, we've got species on Earth of which it ends kind of with the monkey and then there's the human being. And then just above us in our atmosphere, finally, the Pentagon, to the best of my understanding, within the last five years, finally came out and said, OK, OK, yep, there's something flying in the atmosphere. We're not exactly sure what it is. It doesn't conform to our laws of physics. And so at that point now, too, I read this in the New York Times, the paper of record saying the Pentagon said this. So at that point, we can look back now and every single person who question somebody who is claiming ufos and still today somebody who questions it these people are no less stupid today than those that thought it was a flat earth back then the evidence is overwhelming it's been proven and if you choose not to believe it we have no choice but to leave you on your little branch and move forward because it's as real as the nose on your face. And if we're not going to include that fact into our discourse, we're going to go around and around and around, and the world's going to continue to slide into the abyss. Right. And with that are a thousand other questions about that, which we can't completely wrestle to the ground. But what you're pointing out is kind of the logic of it the self-evident logic of it, which was if you were resistant to all these cases, thousands and thousands of cases mm -hmm. from the most trusted people we have, people who have a tremendous amount to lose, you know, guys been in the Air Force for 30 years and yeah. says, hey, I can't hold this secret with me while I die. Here's what happened to me. And by the way, here's five of my buddies who weren't even my buddies, they just served with me. And we all saw the same thing. And it was oh. at this nuclear Air Force base. So if we if we have all those accounts, and now we have, as you said, the Pentagon, who clearly in their admission of this, is also pointing out that they've been the biggest per perpetrators, liars, liars. perpetrators, uh, and, and worse than you know, liars, worse than liars, uh. in the sense that they have intentionally generated disinformation in order to lead people in order to lead people astray so we could get into a whole discussion about what was the agenda behind that and are they evil control or, i control that's the well agenda. and then there's the whole military you want me on that wall you need me on that wall because you really don't so we, that's oh. a whole other that's a whole other discussion what i want to bring people to is again here's matt lambo and we're going to have to tell as as you wrap up, we'll have to say that, yeah. to tell that story, what that's about. But okay. saying, OK, he's just connected those two obvious points is that, OK, all of you who've been holding back the 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 dam with all these accounts, the best, most trusted eyewitnesses that we have, people we say that, that, that we trust with a nuclear bomb, hundreds of them, and we you've not been willing to accept their accounts because you said you're waiting for the government to say that your government, right. as if that's something real, to say it's true. Okay, well, now they said it's true. So what's holding you back now? That's the strength of this book. That's the power of this book to say, no, 
I reduce things down to some fundamental principles. And if I apply these principles consistently, it always seems to land me on my feet where I can kind of figure stuff out. And when somebody knocks me off my feet, it's no problem because all they've done is say, jump over to the next branch, bro. And I say, yeah. I'm fine with the next branch because it's all connected to the trunk and it's all connected to the roots. Yeah. Yeah. It's all pursuit of truth. And the, uh, yeah. So, and it's simple. This is where I get condescending or I sound that way. And I sound so matter of fact, because what we just discussed, that's, that's, uh, self. I mean, it's, it's common sense in my world that we account for this intelligence. And so my patience with people who refuse, again, the question is this, not if this stuff is true or not, it's been proven. What do we do with the willful ignorance? These people constantly are making claims that have been proven untrue. Somehow you have to move past it. We're not moving past it, we're moving above it. You don't have to come with us. But those that are willing to accept these truths, we've elevated our conversation. We're now up to step fact number 30, of which you and I and anybody that wants to contribute, it has the truth has to be a foundation somewhere of which we're picking at. Not I mean, right now there's just no no hierarchy of common sense of which we can discuss from the outside. Does that make sense? It does. Cool. You, <laughs> beautiful. So I tell you, as we as we wrap things up, mm -hmm. Mr. Matt Lambeau is going to <laughs> is going to tell us that great little story about how he came up with the pen name because I think it's 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 quite quite clever. Yeah. Well, it's crucial too. Okay. Because again, when you read the facts, and again, I want to I want to make this crystal clear. Okay. This has nothing to do with me. The only thing you need to know about me as a human being. OK, is that uh, I've got more children than I have A's in both high school and college. And I've got more DWIs than I have children. Yeah, but what I want to know is why do you still love the Packers, even though they break your oh, heart dude. year after year? That is a segue I was hoping for right there. For those of you who don't know, the Packers franchise supposedly is owned by the fans. And so that kind of led to my pen name. Uh, Matt Lambeau, because that premise that Curly had that said, you know what, you give the people the opportunity to manage this franchise, they can actually do it through a cooperative. They all have the same interests. And so I look at the facts the same way. They have nothing to do with me. This is simply intellectual property that belongs to the free world in this, the free world. And the Holy Grail, the way I see it is, we're in an ocean of deception. The Holy Grail is your portal or something like that that says there's a protected place where we can go find truth. And if we go find that truth, we can set out into the world knowing that we're confident because there's somebody defending us. You nailed it. I don't, right, I don't, but it, and, and I think there's some things to add there that I think are interesting because the pushback is, yeah, Matt, but that's not really how it works in terms of how it's kind of implemented and how it is today. But I'll tell you what, to suggest that the ideals, that the vision doesn't matter is to really miss one of the truths and one of the facts. And one of the points I always like to make to people when they kind of want to quote the constitution or the founding fathers is the inalienable rights is two things. One is, no, those guys got a lot of shit wrong. I mean, we had, we had the most incredibly vicious, evil slavery for hundreds of years and then we fixed it for like two years and then we let a bunch of terrorists just pure terrorists instituted again for another hundred years and we all stood by and said well you know it's not really affecting me that much so let's let it go but let's not totally dismiss the ideal the light inalienable rights life liberty pursuit of happiness because even the folks who were subjected to the terror of that institution, they saw the wisdom in that. So there is something to hold on to there. But the other but, thing that I'd make kind of in my iconoclastic way is we always had the inalienable rights. The quote unquote founding fathers didn't give us anything, which is in the same way what your book is about. We always had it. 
if the republic falls tomorrow, will you still have those rights because they are from the roots? They are from the source. And I think that's the Lambeau thing in terms of what you're saying is that collectively we can come together and it isn't going to be perfect, but we can do a pretty good job. And the Packers have done the Packers. What what you think about the Packers? (laughs) They've done pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt about it. And I mean, that's, that's the bottom line is the inalienable rights come from the creator. I mean, they're, they're woven into the fabric of all that is they go beyond an ineffable creator that's saying, listen, this is the life. It's, it's faith, freedom. I, you know, I life, liberty and pursuit of happiness, but they're under attack. You cannot deny that conscious souls that want others to conform to their paradigm of reality are constantly attacking the inalienable rights of others. And so we can either, just life on life's terms, let this destruction of the world and, and it's conquered by evil occur. Hey, life on life's terms, this is the way it's supposed to be. There's a strong case to be made that we're here for the difficulty, so it explains all that. But on the flip side of that, wait a minute, this is these truths are ours. Why would we not circle the wagons and protect this shit? Why just uh, allow the onslaught when we can, starting with one conscious soul, you, start light this little tiny flame of truth where people come and they get them one at a time. And guess what? Once they get here, they go, Oh my God, I'm protected here. I can walk back out into the world with complete confidence and be condescending like Matt Lambeau because I'm so confident in what I know is true. And now we got an army and that that doesn't include the defectors from the dark side. (laughs) Matt, you are you are a joy, buddy. You are unique. You are my brother. <laughs> tell folks about where they're going to find uh, the facts, and okay. tell folks about the website as well. Okay, sounds good. Now, again, the uh, the facts are free. If you want a PDF, and again, I don't whole understand the whole publishing world and this and that, but this is information of which belongs to the free world. So you can always go to selfishtruth.com and get a free PDF. Now, if you want a book or digital, that stuff costs. So there's going to be a cost. But especially Humanity's Last Hope will always be available for free. And what I truly see this book is this, is you can't read it without your life changing for the better, 100% for the better, because all it is is truth. And truth sets you free. It has nothing to do with if I was a counselor. Or an, there's none of that is in there. Sure, you can see that some human being wrote this stuff. But what matters is, hey, do you understand the uh, the past, future, and the now? Do you understand some of the things that were in the road less traveled? Do you understand what was in the untethered soul or the power of now? Or I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I'm just basically going through, pulling out what I know is fundamentally important to humanity and put it first. So wait until you're 58. Let me give you the cliff notes of this stuff. So that's the way humanities it's available. Okay. And I truly believe that if you give a rat's ass about humanity, you want to forward this podcast to someone you love. This book, the facts is a message of love. Again, it's has nothing to do with, I'm just the guy who stumbled upon the idea and went chasing it. The content within the facts, along the lines of the books you've written, they're game changing. You're elevate your consciousness above the fray into the frequency of understanding and the light. So yeah, I believe the book is a game changer. I believe working with you and now having access to the Holy Grail and the 21st century Moses that you are, we can change the world with this stuff, dude. And again, we'll change it. We'll take a look at it. If it isn't articulated to perfection, let's tweak it in and and give people access to the truth. That's it in a nutshell. (laughs) I'm just a messenger. Matt, it's been awesome having you on. And uh, this isn't the end. The conversation will continue. So thanks again so much, man. Alex, I, 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 you understand because we've communicated a bit leading up to this, but I'm truly honored, my friend. Truly, truly honored. Thanks again to Matt for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I'd have is, is there such a thing as a self-evident truth? Are all truths always in every circumstance 
a social construct? Be careful with that one. Realize that the current neurological slash scientific model we live under, materialism, the idea that you are just your brain, leaves no room for anything more than the social construct. Love to hear your thoughts on this and stick around. Plenty more to come. Until next time, take care and bye for now.